very much. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> what I'm going to discuss in a large part reflects the PhD st uh, studies of one of my students, Will Robbins. Uh, I'm going to talk about reef sharks and the uh, title I've had, Are They Abundant, Opportunistic and Resilient Fishes or Rare and Vulnerable Apex Predators, is usually expressed in much more earthy terms. People say, look, there's lots of sharks out there, mate, you know, can't do anything to hurt them. Oh my God, I haven't seen a silver tip for 20 years, someone's killed them all. So uh, sharks, are, most things about sharks are highly controversial. Uh, now, the issue that I'm going to talk about arises largely from publications, among others, by Boris Worm and, uh, uh, and Myers, in which they documented the decline of large oceanic fishes, and especially sharks, over a period, over a long period, and demonstrated that there had been a substantial decline in numbers over the last uh, couple of decades. Even this is controversial, and the results are there's still ongoing dispute uh, amongst fisheries biologists about the magnitude of that decline. Now, there are problems in that. Now, although that sort of information generates the sort of demographic data that Sean uh, Connolly and Missouri have used to uh, produce uh, models which <coughs> which allow us to predict the future behaviour of sharks, they are, by definition, methods which won't give you information on shark abundance in non-fished areas. And moreover, sharks as apex predators are relatively rare, uh, and processing the information takes a long period of time. There's generally a lag, and quite often you'll analyse the results of a fisheries uh, survey and you'll what you predict has already come to pass. So what we wanted to do was find a methodology which would provide a more uh, rapid or recent assessment or snapshot of shark abundances that was independent of fisheries and could be used to monitor shark abundances under conditions of different habitat structure, uh, different uh, fishing pressures, and to monitor numbers over time. Uh, so that, that's the need. We developed for this a protocol which allowed us to estimate shark abundances by visual censuses of sharks and remote video recordings. Now that immediately implied that we had to be dealing with animals that were in a situation where you could effectively monitor them, which means clear water with visibility in excess of 15 to 20 metres and within a depth range which was consistent with... Uh, with scuba diving. Uh, coral reefs are the most appropriate habitat. And there were a couple of species which, or reefs are dominated by two species of Carcharhinus sharks, white tips, Trionodon obesus, and grey reef sharks, Carcharhinus amblyrhynchus, which were good candidates for our study. Now, the other thing that we would have, would have helped us is as one of our desires was to monitor the abundance of sharks in response to varying fishing pressures, we wanted candidate species which would reflect or be sensitive to the activities of anthropogenic influence. Now, to just discuss this, I've just got to go over briefly some of the ground that Sean covered last night and look at the fact that why sharks are vulnerable, and the reason they're vulnerable because of their reproductive biology, they have internal fertilisation, they have uterine development, they have a mammalian pattern of development without the benefits of mammalian uh, um, mammalian uh, parental care. The other thing, because fecundity is limited or influenced by the size of the shark, it's the number of offspring that can develop within their body, there is a, a, a strong relationship between size and fecundity. And just to illustrate this, I'll ask you to briefly look at this diagram. Small sharks, such as Rhizoprionodon, are relatively small. They have low fecundities and uh, as opposed to large sharks, like an example is the bull shark Carcharhinus lucas, about three and a half metres, they have high fecundities. The trade-off, if I could use that term, is that in small sharks, the reproductive processes are more rapid. They have uh, more rapid uh, uh, attainment of maturity. The gestation periods are shorter. They breed annually. Large sharks have slower reproductive processes. They're biennial breeders. The sharks that we're dealing with, Carcharhinus um, amblyrhynchus, 
and try on it on a basis, sit in the cusp between large and small sharks. They have biennial patterns of reproduction, but they have fairly limited fecundities imposed by size, and that in itself implies that they're going to be reasonably sensitive to... Uh, they'll be sensitive to... Uh, anthropogenic disturbances. Now, as we've taken a fair amount of flack about what we did and how we actually analysed uh, estimated shark abundances, I'll just briefly go through the protocol, and that is... Rep oh, someone told me about this. That's uh, replicated 400 by 20 metre counts with a boundary set by GPS along reef fronts, along uh, habitat features on reef fronts, with a calibration of that by remote video recording. Uh, to test this or to trial this, we went to a place where there were a couple of characteristics that we needed. There were abundant sharks. The Cocos Keeling, uh, the Cocos Keeling Islands fulfil that. Sharks were partitioned amongst obvious features of the habitat. They had obvious habitat associations. We chose the grey reef shark because most people who have dived on reefs will know they're more characteristic of uh, outer reef fronts and passes and they're not nearly so abundant in the more sheltered areas of reefs. And as people told us, fish counts are really all in the eye of the beholder and we don't believe what you're telling us, mate. We got two beholders, we got two independent observers to count sharks and this is the result that we got from Carcharhinus amblyrhynchus in the Cocos Keeling Islands. The vertical axis is the mean abundance uh, per 8,000 metres squared. The horizontal axis is the variable of interest, in this case, habitat structure. We were satisfied that this was working and giving us appropriate messages, so we transferred this to the Great Barrier Reef. But in this case, we standardised it for habitat, counting exclusively along the outer fronts of reefs, so the uh, horizontal axis in the slide I'm going to show next reflects fishing pressure. Now, fishing pressure in this case, the uh, partitioning of the Great Barrier Reef into different management zones has a number of features in it. The two that are, or the three that I want to talk about in this case, first of all, there are areas, and we did it in the northern area, and I've identified the reefs that we counted it on, uh, what we call, what could be called preservation zones, which means you can't go into them. If you go into them, the Coast Watch plane comes along and makes several excited passes over you and calls you up on the radio and demands your permit number and things like that. So there's good surveillance of that. Green zones are areas in which you can enter, but you're not allowed to fish. And in this case, blue zones are areas where you can enter and fish. We carried out the count protocol there, the results weren't quite what we expected. Uh, we found that there was a lot of structure in the data, but the, the major abundance of sharks occurred in the, uh, in the pink or preservation zones. We could not distinguish between sharks in the uh, no fishing zones and the, uh, and the general use zones. So... Uh, that set off a frenzy of messenger shooting in the, uh, in the uh, public forums and blogs and that that deal with this sort of thing. And we're accused of all sorts of, uh, I thought, quite, quite in, uh, intriguing approaches to how we collected our data. But I was sufficiently concerned about this to want to examine this on a broader scale to try and determine if we could find these patterns showing up if we expanded the uh, sampling to a number of other areas. So we transported the actual shark assessment protocol to a number of places into the, uh, the edge of the East Pacific, Marquesas and Maria, in the Indian Ocean, the Seychelles, the Cocos Keeling, and on the Eastern Indian Ocean, the Ashmore Scott Reef and Rowley Shoals, and in the Great Barrier Reef, the uh, Marine Park and the, uh, and the Coral Sea. Uh, the data that we got had a lot of heterogeneity into it. It was clear it had to be sorted out. So we found areas where there are very where there, where there reasonably large numbers of sharks and the uh, 
x, the measure of abundance, is uh, number per adjusted or scaled to the number per hectare, and the bottom axis is the locations where we found sharks. There was clearly a great deal of heterogeneity in the data, and we needed to partition it more accurately by localities to look at it. So I'll start with the Indian Ocean. And we looked at the Seychelles, and I'll just talk very briefly about the Seychelles, because the Seychelles has been subject to intensive shark fisheries for a long period of time, and most of it went off as shark meat to Zanzibar, and it still gets collected and caught as shark fins. As you'll see, we got, we didn't record any sharks from the Seychelles, and I'm just going to put it aside, but it's a pity because we swam, I feel as if I swam from La Digue and the uh, areas right up to the north, down through the, uh, down through the Amaranth chain, down to uh, Alphonse and La France, and we got there and said to hell with it, let's go down to uh, the uh, southernmost, the southernmost island groups, to see that, uh, that we'd, were uh, distinct from there, we didn't record any sharks from that area. If we look at the rest of the Indian Ocean, Cocos Christmas and the, uh, off, and the West Australian offshore reefs, uh, we clearly got a number of patterns in the data which I'm going to now uh, describe. Okay, the next group we looked at were Cocos Keeling and... Uh, Christmas Island. We got very, very distinct patterns there. Cocos Keeling had large numbers of sharks. Uh, the vertical axis, uh, the horizontal axis, I'm sorry, includes both Carcharhinus, Amblyrhynchus, and Trionodon obesus. There was clearly a difference between Cocos Keeling and Christmas. Both of them have relatively low populations. There's probably more fishing pressure in Cocos Keeling, but it wasn't reflected in the shark abundance, and what I, what I would argue is, one of the things we argued is that there is an obvious habitat difference in the sense that Cocos Keeling possesses a habitat structure which is dominated by lagoonal systems and individual reefs, whereas Christmas Island has a very restricted reef environment around the, uh, the periphery. So there's evidence emerging that there probably is a habitat feature involved in the uh, structure that we saw. Now, now, what we wanted to do was to look at a pattern of shark abundance in which we could confidently relate differences in fishing pressure to locations, but we would, could accommodate the, the, the question of uh, variation in reef structure could be accommodated. And in the uh, reefs of Western Australia, starting from Ashmore, Scott, and then the Rowley Shoals, Clark and Imperi an Imperius Reef, we found a location where we could adequately test this, the effect of fishing pressure, because Ashmore and Scott are within, the, uh, within a management zone which allows access of Indonesian fishermen to those reef systems, whereas the, uh, the, the uh, Rowley Shoals is protected uh, from, from the sorts of fishing pressures which occurred further to the uh, north. Now, the results that we got, if you look at decreasing fishing pressure, Ashmore and Scott Reef are fished and have been fished fairly heavily by Indonesian fishermen for sharks. As you move down to the uh, Rowley Shoals to Clark and Imperius Reef, the numbers of sharks, in, the numbers of sharks increase, and the, the abundances that we saw were rather similar to the abundances at uh, Cocos Island and to protected areas of the Great Barrier Reef. So our conclusion is that uh, what, this ref what, what we're seeing is a gradient, the uh, influence of a gradient in fishing pressure. Now back to the Great Barrier Reef, we wanted then to examine the abundance and distribution of sharks on the Great Barrier Reef to revisit 
the areas which the preservation zones or pink reef areas in the northern area of the reef and compare that to reef systems in the Coral Sea which are presently protected by legislation. The Coringa Herald Reef System is closed to shark, to, to shark fishing and moreover they are protected by the distance from the shore. So the information that we received from there was that the, what I've got are the areas of the preservation zones on the Great Barrier Reef on the <coughs> on the left hand side of the graph we can see that there were high abundances of both species of sharks at Southwest Herald in the Coral Sea uh, there were abundances, similar abundances of grey reef sharks and white tips trianid on obesis. In the northeast herald they were slightly they were slightly lower numbers. Now our interpretation of that is that there is probably a habitat feature, a habitat structure feature involved in shark abundances. Southwest Herald is a reef with a number of habitats including lagoonal systems and a fair amount of complexity and in that sense it is similar to the preservation zones or pink reefs on the Great Barrier Reef. North, Northeast Herald is a much smaller reef with a restricted range of habitats so we think that our interpretation would be that this reflects not a fishing pressure or an activity of fishing, but it rep reflects an underlying habitat feature. Now, Marquesas and Maria was the other place we also looked at. At the moment, the picture from I'll get it right in a minute. The picture from the Marquesas and Moria is confusing. Uh, Moria has both shark fishing and shark feeding. The Marquesas represents a different system. It's a uh, low temperature, high productivity reef system. There's a number of sharks, but we didn't find the candidate species that we had looked at, that we had looked for in the other reefs. So basically, our at the moment, the Marquesas and Moria, the Eastern Pacific Reefs, we place in the too hard basket. We also carried out estimates of shark abundance using video cameras because there's a fair amount of criticism at the beginning that sharks will be attracted to divers and we should use an independent method such as uh, assessment using uh, video cameras, remotely uh, deployed video cameras to assess shark abundance. In doing so, and this is in the northern Great Barrier Reef area, such as the no entry preservation zones, the green no take zones and the blue open zones, we got essentially the same picture that we got from the underwater swims or census counts, but what we didn't get was the amount of precision that we, that, uh, the amount of precision that we could use to make distinctions between the uh, uh, between the different uh, zoning categories of the reef. So you know we're we're reasonably happy that the vi that the remote video counting backs up what we got from uh, visual censuses. The other aspect of criticism which related to our work was that there is we had obviously worked within a depth zone which was, could accommodate scuba diving, a certain degree of water clarity. The message was that if you had looked at deeper areas beyond the dive zone, you'd probably find large populations of sharks, so any implications of reduced shark numbers in areas that we could access by diving would probably be uh, modified by if we had a, a, uh, a depth component. Mike Capo of Ames, God bless his heart, carried out an intensive study of the Great Barrier Reef from depths to about 10 to 100 metres using brubs, baited remote underwater video cameras, and recorded in them 
the number of fish that came to the baited area, which is rather, which is exactly similar to our uh, to our shallow water systems, per unit time. What he got for Kakarai and Assembly Rinkus, the red dots represent the grey reef shark. The red dots represent the number of stations in which he assessed shark abundance, uh, which, he, which he deployed videos. The green dots estimate recordings in which the grey reef shark, Kakarinus amblyrhynchus, appeared. We had essentially a similar message for the white tip reef shark, Trianodon obesus. So our contention that there was probably a depth-related distribution feature within, the, within these reef sharks is, uh, to, a reason, to a reasonable extent, borne out. So our conclusions are that there's strong evidence that reef shark populations are impacted by even moderate levels of fishing. And to embellish that, I'll just have, I'll point out that in green, no fishing zones, there was evidence of depletion of sharks and if fishing's occurring in there, it's going on at a fairly low level, so the issue of shark sensitivity to fishing was borne out. Long swim visual transects are an appropriate tool for monitoring reef shark abundances. In uh, declines in shark abundances are manifested at a variety of spatial scales over a range of areas. However, there's a caveat here, Evaluation of fishing effects may be confounded by differences in reef structure, size and configuration, so you should standardise that, standardise that if possible. All shark species appear to be vulnerable to fishing impacts. Reef sharks with intermediate size ranges and biennial reproduction, low fecundities, are especially problematical. There is, as, we can, as far as we can determine, no refuge in depth. A number of people contributed to this, which occurred over a fairly large uh, global scale. I'd like to pay particular tribute to Mike Capo of Ames, who assisted me with this. Thank you. <laughs>